Hey, hey, hey. Hey, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Wives Who Win Community. Welcome to, come on, here, y'all. Welcome to Friday Night Live. Super duper excited tonight to be talking with you all, sharing with you all. Come on in, come on in, come on in. <clears throat> Hello to my replay viewers. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you so much for watching the replay. I truly appreciate it. Let me know where you guys are chiming in from. Where are you and what part of the world are you at? Hey, hey, hey. Let me know. Let me know so I can acknowledge you. I can say, hey, girl. Hey, I can give you a shout out. Let me know. Let me know. Let me know. Tonight we are talking about a juicy, juicy discussion and we are on part two of the discussion talking about building and rebuilding trust after infidelity. So I am ready to dive in deep, ready to dive in deep. So let me know where you're chiming in from. Um, my name is Cheryl Rabinell. For those that do not know who I am, I am a wife success coach and I help wives to improve communication and master maximize intimacy in their marriage so they, they can partner with their husbands in building a God-centered marriage. Marriage is a God idea. Hey, Charleston. Hey, Jersey. And when you take him out of the equation, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, trouble there in will lies. There's been different studies and research that have been done to say that having a religion or practicing a religion with your spouse does increase the chances of marital satisfaction and increases the chances or decreases the chances of having in, uh, infidelity or having any type of a fear. And then there's other research that would like to combat that uh, to say that religion, yeah, it's good uh, when you're talking about different regimens and just trying to be emotionally stable, but it does not necessarily help or contribute to the uh, fidelity of the marriage relationship. I have my personal opinion on that because I truly believe that if you and your spouse are working together and if you do have a religion that you practice and that you study, uh, that that in itself will bring you closer together. Now, marriage is a God idea. So that means that God is the head of that marriage. So if you are practicing other religions or other uh, type of rituals outside of that, then I'm not sure how that's going to going to work out for you because God is the creator of a marriage covenant. So, hey guys, how are you all doing this evening? It's Friday. It's Friday night. I was playing my African beats. I love music and I love African music. Uh, so I just wanted to introduce you guys to that. So how many of you are excited about this conversation tonight? Let me know by show of hands, how many are excited? Tonight, we're going to talk about the violator's role, the violator's role, the violator, the betrayal, betrayer. Um, basically, the violator is the person that violated, is the person that stepped out on the marriage, is the person that uh, opened the door, if you would, uh, to the infidelity. And they, if you would, permitted it to happen because they stepped out of the agreement. So anytime you step out of the agreement, uh, you step out of the commitment, then most of the blame, if you would, would fall on you and most of the responsibility to restore the marriage will fall on you as well. And I'm going to explain to you why that is or what that will look like. <clears throat> About 75% of marriages survive if the husband cheats. And 65% survive if the wife cheats. Marriages in which the husbands cheat, of course, are more likely to survive. And it's believed because men are less likely than women to have an emotional attachment to their mistress. Normally when a man has, a, uh, in, in, uh, has experienced infidelity or has an affair, the first thing our purpose of that affair is not because they want an emotional bond or attachment. Whereas with women, when they have or we have an affair, because I'm a woman, I have to count myself, we are looking for some emotional connection. 
right? We're looking to be emotionally, mentally stimulated, not necessarily sexually stimulated. It, it, there are some cases where that is true, but most of the time, if a wife were to step out a net or something <laughs> on her marriage is because she's looking for some type of emotional bond. Infidelity is the most common occurrence in marriage and it's the most cited reason for divorce divorce in most cultures is the most common and it's the most cited, right? So when we talk about infidelity in the context of a dyadic, dyadic two-person relationship, uh, it represents a partner's violation of regulating, violation of norms, regulating the level of emotional or physical intimacy with the people outside of the marriage relationship. So when you go outside of the marriage relationship, you're automatically allowing room for other things to happen, right? You're allowing other things to happen. To, to, you're allowing other things to come inside that marriage. You're violating the principle. If you were to that marriage, you're violating the integrity of that marriage. And I want to say you are even violating the purpose of that marriage because why was marriage created? Why, why did God create marriage, anybody? I feel like I'm sideways a little bit. Do I look, oh no guys, let me straighten up my chair. Why did God create marriage? I want you guys to talk back to me tonight. <clears throat> why was marriage created? What's the purpose for marriage? Anytime you misuse a thing or abuse a thing, then you know, the repercussions behind that are inevitable. So anytime you misuse a thing, that's why I wanted to say abuse of that thing is inevitable. So when you misuse a thing or you don't understand a thing, then the chances of you abusing it is more likely to happen. Does that make sense? I need y'all to talk back with me. Talk back to me. Talk back to me. Infidelity, it not only has negative consequences on the person that's actually doing it, right? The betrayal, but it also causes issues in the marriage. It causes issues with the children. It causes issues in the economy, if you believe it or not. It causes issues in the church. So when someone decides to step out of their marriage, there are so many other uh, effects of that that can happen, right? You know, relationships suffer as it relates in the confines of social relationships. So relationships with your joint friends, right? Because if we are at odds with one another, because now infidelity has stepped in to our marriage, you're less likely to want to hang out and have a good time with your besties as a couple, right? That's probably not happening as much. So some of the negative consequences is anger, self-doubt, frustration, and all of these things can occur as a result of the infidelity. And let's not forget the big one, divorce, right? Divorce can happen. But we already see that, you know, there is uh, four out of 10 marriages have experienced infidelity. And all about half of that, half of those marriages can recover and they can restore. That's great. That's great news, y'all. That's great news. But we don't want to even go down that route. So one of my mentors, uh, Dr. John Gottman, Gottman and his wife, Julia Gottman, they came up with this strategy, if you would, or this, um, this method of how can you recover and what is necessary. So the reason why the betrayer, the betrayer or the violator is more responsible in making sure that that marriage recover is because he or she has to do more of the work. They have to do more of the work because they are the ones that violated the marriage covenant. They are the ones that stepped out. They are the ones that made the decision. It doesn't matter why the decision was made. They are the ones that made the decision. They are the one that you know allowed for this uh, stoppage, if you would, to occur in their marriage. And the stoppage that I'm referring to is the connection between them and their spouse, is the bond between them and their spouse. 
It's the love between them and their spouse. It's the sex between them and their spouse. So this person has to be open and up in arms, ready to do whatever it takes to make sure that marriage survives. What I want to say before we go on any further, if you're currently in this place or know someone that's in this place of infidelity and wanting to recover the marriage, the first thing that you have to do is the affair must stop. Somebody type that for me. That can be that can be like, oh, that's a no brainer trail, but you would think it is. The affair must stop. All tides, all associations to that person must now cease. No goodbyes, no long goodbyes, no one last time, no talking it through, none of that. It must stop by way of text, preferably, by way of you know a note, a letter, an email. It must stop. You don't owe that person any type of emotional uh, connection in your response. So you don't have to go back and forth. You don't have to answer questions. It has to stop. So beyond that, the person that betrayed the marriage may need to change their phone number. They may need to change their social media platforms, remove friends, uh, what have you. Or in some cases, I knew of a couple may need to get a different job. So if the affair happened or began at the same environment in which you work and that person is there, you can no longer work in that establishment or that department or that place. It's going to be very hard, especially when you're on the road to recovery in your marriage. So if you are the violator uh, or you know someone that is, then please share with them that if they want their marriage to survive and if they want their marriage to overcome this place of infidelity, then they have to stop the affair. That is non-negotiable, non-negotiable. It must cease. It must stop. Okay. So the three things I'm going to share with you tonight are three ways. So once we have decided that the fear is going to stop, once we've decided that we are going to work through this marriage, there are three things that are vital and it's the revival method. It's the trust revival method, three stages. Somebody put three stages for me, if you would. And my replay viewers, thank you so much again. I'm just going to pause for the cause. I am Cheryl Ravenel, your wife's success coach. I help you to improve communication and maximize intimacy in your marriage so you can partner with your husband in building a God-centered marriage. Marriage is a God idea. And when you take him out of the equation, trouble therein lies and sometimes trouble beyond your ability to control, manage, or overcome. So the three stages are atonement, attunement, and attachment or atone, attune, and attach, whichever you want to say. Atonement, attunement, and attachment. So the atonement stage is the hardest stage to work through. And in this stage, uh, in order for recovery to take place, the person that cheated must take full blame. They must take full fault, fault as well as make amends for their actions. They must be willing to make amends with their spouse for their actions. So if your spouse is blaming you, accusing you at this stage, you got to take it. This person must take full responsibility and be very patient in dealing with all of the mishap that comes with this. And catch this, you have to do all of this, betrayer, without becoming defensive. You, you don't have any defense, it doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter if she was not having sex or he was not having sex. Uh, he was not or she was not paying you any attention. Uh, if they were rejecting you, if they, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The reason does not matter. You cannot defend yourself in this state. Making amends cannot happen if the person that cheated is blaming the other person for their cheating. I have seen it. It happened to me in a previous relationship, right? I was being blamed because he was cheating. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't matter what, what caused you, drove you, contributed to, or inspire you, or encourage you to do whatever you did. You did it. You went out. It was your responsibility to protect the purpose, the integrity of this marriage. And you decided in the principles of this marriage and you decided not to do that. So that's all on you. So they must take the full blame. And here's the thing. The person that experiences the wounded person, if you would, which uh, 
we utilize that word in the psychology space, the wounded person, um, you know, they can develop a severe um, cause of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. That person can severely suffer as a result of trauma of infidelity. Infidelity is a form of trauma. Did y'all know that? Infidelity is a form of trauma. And anytime trauma is present, then there are other things that can happen as a result of this trauma. So that person or you, if you've been in this place, may have experienced depression, uh, hypervigilant. And hypervigilant is basically you're constantly looking for signs of the affair or continuing or, or, or thinking another one is going to happen. It's going to happen again. The fear is still happening or another one is going to happen again. You find yourself lack of sleep, lack of eating, uh, lack of wanting to be your old self. You find yourself uh, feeling hopeless, feeling helpless, not happy, not satisfied, not fulfilled. You can really find yourself in a very dark place. Anxiety, worry consumes you. All of those things can happen. And here's the thing. The person that violated the marriage must be very patient and they must be willing again to do whatever it takes to help you through this place of infidelity. And this is the atonement stage. We haven't even gotten to the other. And again, the atonement stage is the hardest stage. Yes, it is the hardest stage, right? Because when we think about, when we think about trauma, Right. Trauma in its definition is a, a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. But in the psychological terms, psychological trauma is damage to the mind that occurs as a result of a distressing event. Would you not agree that infidelity is a distressing event? Trauma is often the result of an overwhelming amount of stress that exceeds to one exceeds one's ability to cope or integrate the emotions involved in that experience. So would you not agree that if you experience infidelity from your husband that you love so dearly or your wife, uh, if a husband just so happens to watch this, that you love so dearly that you gave your life to, that you st stood in front of hundreds and some people, thousands of people to declare your love and commitment to, and then they... Uh, turn around and cheat on you, right? That's a distressing event, right? And then the amount of stress that you're going to experience as a result of that, that happening, because you won't be able to cope. You won't be able to get your emotions under control and uncontrollable crying, uncontrollable again, worrying, and all of those things are going to take place. So that is the trauma that you have to experience, that you will experience as a result of that, right? So in this atonement stage, what you're doing is you're you should be able to explain your feelings about the affair. And your 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 spouse or the betrayer, the person that betrayed the marriage, should be able to explain what happened. Right. All this has to take place without blaming, without attacking your partner. Now, when I say what happened, we're not asking for sexual experiences. I know some people in the past and I've even heard of stories like this where the, the person, the wounded person wants to know what happened. How did it happen? How did y'all have sex? Did you enjoy the sex with him or her? All of that is irrelevant. You're not asking those type of questions. But do you do want to ask what happened, why it happened, you know, um, and you do want to ask, you know, where did you meet this person? Why were you attracted to that person? Those type questions, right? So in all of this asking and talking, the violator must hear the feelings, hear what, what the person has been wounded is feeling, you know, be able to take those feelings as, as hard as it may be and as comfortable as it may be to hear that they have to hear, they have to sit, they have to hear. And then when asked the question, they have to respond accurately and honestly, because this is the thing in order for marriage number two to take place, this has to take place because you're, the old marriage is gone. So now we're at a place where we have to rebuild. We made up in the mind um, that the marriage is going to go on. So it's rebuilding the marriage. And if you know anything about building or rebuilding anything, you know, you have to tear down that foundation or whatever is left of that foundation or maybe prime whatever is there. And then you begin building on top of that. So we're now building marriage number two, right? So the betrayer at this point must express their remorse and also their regret to what they have done. They must express that. 
you know, they're not analyzing the marriage yet. They're just expressing how sorry they are, how remorseful they are, and things of that nature. Extremely apologetic. It may be, seem like it's overkill, but it has to be extremely apologetic on their end because you have violated the covenant relationship, right? You violated the covenant relationship. Number two, number two is attunement. And we're just going to go over number two. I'm going to give you a little bit. Um, I'm just going to give you the topic again of number three. And then we're going to pick up number three next week because I want to contain this conversation next week. And I really want you all to come with your questions. So your questions, your statements and things of that nature, I want you to come with those on next week because these conversations are designed to be about 30 minutes or so. So I don't want to go overboard and I don't want to get into something that I cannot finish um, on tonight. And I don't want to go beyond the time frame. Okay. So in this phase uh, of the revival method, if you would, couples can possibly reach some level of forgiveness. And the focus is building the new relationship. So this sole focus right here is building a new relationships. So attunement as defined is the desire and the ability to understand and respect your, your spouse's inner world, right? So understanding their inner world and in doing so, you're sharing vulnerabilities and things that your partner is feeling or would have stopped them from feeling or things that can stop them from feeling lonely, invisible, inadequate. So you, you, the reason why you're sharing the vulnerabilities is because you want them to start again uh, or if they've never begin to experience that they're safety with you, they're safe with you. You want you want their heart to feel safe with you. You want them to feel secure, right? Because we're building marriage number two, and in marriage number one, that may not have happened, right? Because we've already found out that why the person decided to cheat. And I'm just going to say this: um, infidelity doesn't always happen because somebody wants to have sex. That's like that's one of the I don't know the benefit I should say. Um, because benefit to me indicates it's something good, but that's one of the byproducts uh, of the cheating. So people typically do not cheat because they're looking for someone to have sex with. People cheat because these are other reasons, because there's an opportunity to do so, because they are bored and they cannot or choose not to communicate with their spouse and telling their spouse what they want, what they need, and the cheating, a lot of times it doesn't start off sex. It may start off as conversations, right? It starts off as a conversation. It starts off at, as we're just hanging out. It starts off in Facebook Messenger. It starts off in inbox or direct message. It starts off in emailing. It starts off texting. It starts off, oh, let me meet you for lunch. It starts off, let's go to dinner. You know, it starts off that way. It doesn't start, it doesn't go straight into sex, even as, although in some cases sex may happen um, more, more, uh, quicker or happen quicker than others. It doesn't start like that. So there's something that drives, something that they see, something that they experience, something that they've encountered uh, that they like and that they want, that they are not getting from their spouse or they're just, just the opportunity has presented themselves and this person lacks self-control and lacks discipline. So they chosen to then violate the marriage. So I do want to say that. So at this point, when we're talking about attunement, uh, you're sharing vulnerabilities to stop your partner from feeling lonely and invisible. So share that uh, uh, vulnerability. So uh, your vulnerability may be talking about something in your childhood, right? Your vulnerability uh, may be talking about one of your weaknesses or your insecurities uh, or your doubts, your fears and things of that nature, something that you may have shared with that person that you, the third person, the third party is what it's called, uh, something you may have shared with that person. Now, this is the time to be very open, honest, and transparent with your spouse and sharing your truth. What is your truth? What is really the problem? What is really the issue? What's really going on, right? These are things that we have to share. And typically we don't feel comfortable sharing vulnerabilities. Why? Because we've not had to do that. You know, look at past relationships, even look at how you grew up in the household. You know, did you and your family sit around and talk about your vulnerabilities and talk about your weaknesses and your insecurities? Um, 
The answer to that is probably no, because when you express an insecurity or when you were shown to be weak or vulnerable in an area, what were you told to man up, to woman up, to brush it off, to get over it? Um, we don't act like that and all these other things. Am I right or am I right? Right. So we have not been taught to share vulnerabilities. And that's why I always say that you have to go back in order to move forward. You have to look back in these cases, when you're talking about marriage, when you're talking about marriage relationships, when you're talking about longevity in marriage, when you're talking about trying to restore and rebuild, you have to look back to see what happened, when and why, and how is what happened, when and why it happened, now contributing to the, um, contributing to the downfall of my marriage. What is impacting, what is affecting uh, or affecting the the satisfaction, the happiness, uh, the peace, or what have you in my marriage. So a lot of times you and your spouse have to look back and be able to look at your marriage story. What is my marriage story? What does that look like? What did I see growing up? What did I experience growing up? What habits, what behavior, what mindset have I adopted and I have um, embraced as a result of what I, how, what I saw and how I grew up, right? So we have to be able to do that. Go back in order to go forward. So in this attunement stage, you're uh, you're choosing you're choosing to revive the marriage, right? So we're choosing to revive the marriage. Forgiveness again is very vital. That must take place. And forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean you forget. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're never ever going to talk about it again. However, that first stage, I'm going to say this: that first stage, that atonement stage, that can take a long time. That can take months. Just to be honest with you, that can take months. So in this whole journey, there's a lot of patience that needs to happen on both ends. And the person that violated the marriage has to be particularly patient and also do work on themselves. So it will not, they will not be encouraged or influenced by self or others to again, go out and do the same thing. So they have to have a lot of patience. I talk with couples, I've had clients that have been in this place. And, and in this instance, it was a wife, uh, the wife who was my client and infidelity took place. And her husband wanted her to quickly get over it because he wanted to have sex with her and he wanted all these things. And it does not work like that. You can't just be over it and let me roll over and give you what you want. No, there trauma. <laughs> Trauma, trust has been violated. Anytime trust has been violated, it's going to take time to rebuild that trust. Many of you know that because some may be still dealing with mommy issues and daddy issues, uh, violations from childhood trauma and even adulthood trauma. And you're still trying to build yourself back to trusting somebody that violated you, right? So that takes a long time. So the attunement process can also take a while. That can also take months. These are not one and done. This is not go to a six week counseling session and then we're back together and happy again. No, this takes time. It doesn't even matter if you're saved or not. Your relationship with God is where it is or not. It still takes time. The good thing is it is you do have God and you have counseling or coaching, but just having a relationship with God in itself is not going to get you back on a jump start to where your marriage is just in this perfect place. You have to work at that. Okay. So I'm going to give you a few more here and then we'll pick up. I have a lot more on here. So we'll, I'll just give you a few more Then we're going to pick back up. I'll answer questions and we'll pick it back up next week. So forgiveness must take place. The focus again is building marriage number two, marriage number two. Okay. And I'm going to say this last thing and I'm going to open the floor for questions. Let me just bookmark this so I'll know where I stopped at. Okay. So you have to identify what needs were not getting met and why did the affair happen? What went wrong? So this is that core area right here in the attunement stage. What went wrong? What went wrong? And this is not, you didn't love me. You didn't show me any attention. You didn't want to have sex with me. That's not what we're doing here. It's saying, I felt unlove. I felt that I was not getting enough attention. I felt lonely. I felt insecure about our marriage, insecure about being a wife or being a husband. This is the time you're expressing what happened. Why did it happen? I felt I was not 
I was not valued. I feel like I'm not valued. I feel like I'm underappreciated in this marriage. I feel like I am overwhelmed and I'm always doing the work. I feel like I'm unsupported. So y'all get that? So that's how you would address that. What happened? Not you weren't there for me. I told you that I needed you to be there for me. And I told you I needed more attention and you failed to show up. That's that we're not doing that. That's not going to get anywhere. And that's all that's going to just throw you back into phase one or even before that phase. Okay. So next week we will talk more about attunement and then we'll go into attachment. And the week following, I have a juicy, juicy, juicy um, segment for you guys because I will have a special guest that's going to be coming on and sharing her story of infidelity. So on the 31st, I have a special guest that's going to be coming on with me and I'm going to be interviewing her. She's going to talk about her story of healing and hope, love and forgiveness and how her and her husband were able to overcome infidelity and the blessing that came as a result. I don't know why I want to say as a result, the blessing that they've experienced. Let me say that the blessing that their marriage is currently experiencing. So I'm super excited to talk with her. I've known her for a long time and I'm just glad I'm going to ask her to share her story. She said yes, because I want to give you hope. I want to give you hope that there's hope after infidelity, even if you're in that place now and things are going on right now. If you want your marriage, if you desire your marriage, I believe that there is hope. And the first thing that does have to happen, however, is whoever is violating the marriage must stop. That must stop. You at least have to be on the same page that we want our marriage. We don't know how this is going to work out. We don't know what we're going to do or what to what extent we're going to do it yet. But one thing we agree on is that the affair must stop and it must stop today. And then you have to put boundaries in place and you have to put measures in place. Uh, so that person has been totally disconnected from you guys' life. Uh, you may have to even put some legal things in place. So that person is totally disconnected from your life and you guys can move forward, begin to move forward. Was this good or was this good? Let me know. Let me know. Let me know one takeaway. My replay viewers, let me know at least one takeaway you took away from the segment today. Let me know if this has been helpful to you. I hope and I pray that I helped at least one person on this evening, one person at least, because if I did that, I believe that I have done the my responsibility of what God has called me to do and help helping couples to build a God-centered marriage. So I will stay on for just... 20 seconds and answer any questions that you have. And then we'll meet back up on next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, all right. If there are no questions, I have enjoyed my time with you all today. Again, I hope and pray that I've helped at least one person and that you'll be able to take away, still take away. Let me know what your takeaways are from this conversation tonight. Uh, if you have any topics or anything that you want to want me to talk about, want me to share, definitely share those with me. You can post it in the group, inbox me, email me at info at wives2win.com. I'm excited about our next month's topic. Woo, it's going to be juicy, juicy, juicy. I mean, for what the year, the end of the year is going to bring. So I would be remiss if I did not tell you that our Elevate Your Life Experience annual event is going to be August 6th through the 8th. August 6th through the 8th is going to be virtual. It's going to be a free event, and I'll be sharing some more details with you regarding that. And I hope that each and every one of you will join us for that virtual experience. It's going to be absolutely amazing, life-changing, tra life-transforming. Our events are not motivationally inspired. Our events are transformational inspired. And you will leave that event with uh, tools, resources, and roadmaps to where you can immediately implement so that you can begin to experience the life that you desire and that you deserve. I should say the life and relationships. So that would be August 6th through the 8th, August 6th, 7th, and 8th. That's a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, all virtually. All right, you guys. Well, I hope you have a blessed evening and I will see you, well, Monday morning for prayer. 
Monday morning for prayer at 5.30 a.m. And every Friday, we are here for Friday Night Live, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here in the Wives Who Win community. Okay, you guys, enjoy your weekend. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.